and uh, continue with Lydia. As Lydia said, we're now, the afternoon is about the continents. We've done uh, the continental, the boundaries of the continents and plate tectonics' influence on that. And this part is all about the continental interiors. Uh, and we're going to start at a very high and lofty place, which is in Tibet and, uh, and Central Asia. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing Peter Molnar here, who's going to take us through his experiences there and the role of tectonics in Central Asia, but also its influence on climate. To you, Peter. Thanks, Mike. Yes, I'm going to talk about Tibet. Uh, and let's just put this up right now. Um, and I'm talking about the internal um, te tectonics of internal Tibet, of the middle of Tibet. Oh, no point with that, do I? This. So we're up here. And <laughs> and, and I think, I hope we all agree that uh, plate tectonics fails in continents. And if you don't agree, I'm just going to quote one sentence here. It, this is re reflecting back, it, of course, is plate tectonics, quickly became clear that it did not provide an understanding of continental tectonics. Uh, I'm, um, you'll have to figure out who said that, but <laughs> I'm not the only one who feels that way. But in deference to the 50th uh, anniversary of plate tectonics, I have one plate tectonics slide. This is shown here. Uh, reconstructions of India. India here cut off at the Himalaya. Of course, all the rock in the Himalaya is Indian rock. Shown here at 45 million years ago or so, approximately when collision took place way back here near 70 million years ago, and at various times of easily identified magnetic anomalies. So on the right, the blue is showing the distance from the present position going back on the northwest corner of India up there, and the red showing the northeast corner. You can see that back before, about 50 million years ago, India was going very fast towards Eurasia, more than 100 millimeters a year. <clears throat> and then it slowed down sometime between 50 and 40, and we all think that's when the collision took place. However you define collision today, because unfortunately this has become more com complicated as we've learned more. So you slow down India this way. So one more introductory slide. This is an animation made by Tanya Atwater for me, for my birthday. And I point out, it honors my prejudices, but not all the facts. <laughs> and, and I say this because if you think it's wrong, you got to blame me, not her. She, she did as well as she could to get what I wanted. OK, so what we have here is, is, is crust in light brown, thin under the oceans, blue or ocean here. Uh, and then in red is mantle. The dark red is mantle lithosphere, and what you're going to see is India move north, collide with southern Asia, slices of India will be taken off the top to build the Himalaya on India, and Tibet will fold up in the back, or shorten up back in here. Now, I don't control this. Could you set this going? I want to say there it goes. There it goes. So India goes north. It plunges underneath eventually. Uh, Southern Asia. I think you have to hit this little, yeah, yeah, that one right there. Hmm. We loaded this up. Okay, so I guess I'm going to skip this. Uh, it, it, well, it worked earlier. You, you can download it from her website. Uh, we did run it earlier. Maybe it's the difference between morning and afternoon. That's the difference. Okay, so what you would see is India come in here. India will penetrate in quite far, of course. Slices of India will be thrust atop India, and then the whole of Tibetan, uh, the whole of the Tibetan crust will thicken quite a bit, thicken more in the south than in the north, and you'll see blobs dropping off and stuff that some of you I know don't believe. <laughs> okay, tough. What's happening now? This is this whole region becomes thick, thick crust. It's happened because of north-south crustal shortening. What do we have today? What's going on today? And why doesn't it advance? Doesn't advance. I push the green button. Oh, I got to point at you. There we go. Thank you. Uh, so most of you know these symbols. That the colors, the brown is high elevation, greater than about 5,000 meters. So this is the Tibetan Plateau. These, all of these symbols show the location of an earthquake. 
These are lower hemisphere diagrams of the focal sphere, or if you like, lower high hemisphere projections of the strain field associated with the earthquake. But if you don't know all that, just think blue is normal faulting. So all of these blue ones in here, these are all showing normal faulting. And they're all showing east-west extension. Black is strike slip. So for instance, that one is either right lateral on a northwest southeast plane or left lateral on a northeast southwest plane. All the strike slip ones show east-west extension as well, but no crustal thinning. And then the red ones, of course, are thrust faulting, thrust faulting along the Himalaya down here, up here in the Chilean Chan in here. Now, if you plot these, as uh, John Elliott did, as a function of the, of the uh, elevation of the surface above you, the normal faults are all at high altitude, with an exception. That's just flexure of the Indian plate. And the thrust faults are lower. So what's happening is that the Tibetan Plateau is spreading apart where, it's, where you have high, high elevations, and these surrounding margins are undergoing crustal shortening. So if, if this is too complicated for you, let me give you a homely analogy. <laughs> Tibet is just a humongous piece of camembert cheese. It's out of the box now. It's spreading out onto the Indian plate and spreading out, and it's undergoing thinning right now. OK, but let's think back about this. We built the Tibetan Plateau by crustal thickening, north-south crustal shortening, crustal thickening. You don't build a plateau by having normal faulting. This is screams as loudly as you can scream, with earthquakes at least, uh, that some change must have taken place. There must have been a change in what's going on because you've gone from crustal shortening to thinning. How thick the layer is, it thins. We can argue about, I'm going to assume it's the whole crust, and I'll argue strongly for that if I have to. Uh, but that's the assumption that I'm going to make. OK, when did this start? Started sometime since 15 or 10 million years ago. This is a map, again, of Tibet. Each of these is an arrow showing a place where recently, almost all of these are 21st century studies, where someone has, or some people have gone in and determined when the normal faulting began. They've dated the fault. They've gotten cooling ages from when you've exhumed the rock, filled up the sediments, filled up the basins with sediment. And the oldest, 14 million years, here's one 13 and a half. They're all younger than 15. Some of them are a little younger than 10. But 10 or 15 million years is not a bad guess for when, for when the normal faulting began. OK, we can do a little better. Let's look at GPS. This is a map of GPS velocities relative to India. If you're looking at Tibet, the best reference frame is, of course, India. You don't want to be way up in Eurasia for a reference frame. The green ones are ones that are, have big errors, for instance, or they don't fit for some reason. The red ones, I don't know if you can see this as well as I hoped you could, but in eastern Tibet, there's an eastward component of motion. Western Tibet, there's a westward component of, of motion. That just tells you that the east and west have to be moving apart. It doesn't tell you much more than that. But what one can do is take these data and make a strain rate map. And in, in particular, what we've looked at, the blue and green show aerial expansion. So this is where the area of the surface is getting larger. It could be places where it's shortening a little bit in one direction, but it's getting wider in the other direction. So the whole of Tibet, essentially the whole of Tibet, the area is increasing. The margins, the area is getting, is getting smaller. Red and yellow show crustal contraction, where you're thickening. Well, of course, along the Himalaya, you have that up in the Chilean Shan. We can take this, and we can get a rate of aerial expansion. Rock's incompressible. Uh, is, because it's incompressible, um, we can convert that rate of expansion into a rate of thinning, the vertical thinning rate. And we can use that rate. We can take that thinning rate. If we extrapolate that present day thinning rate back 10 or 15 million years, and we assume area isostasy, so we're assuming the whole crust thins at that rate for 10 to 15 million years, and it's area isostasy, this leads to a 1,000 meter drop in the mean elevation of Tibet since this time. That's a big drop. Tibet's already pretty high. Those of you who've been there uh, know, know what it's like. Imagine going 1,000 meters high, higher. That, this is what we get from this. This is just arithmetic and, and some assumptions, of course, that one, one might challenge. OK, so what do we take from this? Uh, between 10 and 15 million years ago, Tibet stopped thickening, or it had stopped by this time. It began to spread apart. Its crust thinned. It grew outward, become a wider plateau and its mean elevation began to de decrease. 
So now I'm going to take you through uh, the interpretation that some of us like. Um, we aren't that many in this world, but, uh, but at least some of them are pretty smart, so I feel at home with them. Start up here. Imagine you have crust, that's the brown, over mantle lithosphere, that's the blue. You shorten it horizontally, so you thicken the crust. Well, area isostasy will tell you you've got to have a, a high mountain range or a plateau. But you have to do something with the mantle lithosphere, so assume you thicken it. Okay, assume that the composition of this mantle lithosphere for the major elements isn't any different from what's underneath. If you make that assumption, this is colder than there and colder than ne next door, and it's also more dense. Hence, because it's more dense, it should pull the surface down a little bit more, pull a little bit, so that the mean elevation would be lower than it would be in pure area isostasy. Because you have this lateral difference in density, this is unstable. This wants to go away. So let's take it away. The light blue shows that it's been removed. So you take a load off of this. You remove it with blobs of bandle lithosphere. Take them off. The surface should rise. The surface should go up. England and Hausman made this point 20 years ago. 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Take that, and, and the lithosphere gains what I, I've called available potential energy. This is what Lorenz, the atmospheric scientist, called it. The lithosphere has enormous potential energy, but most of it's completely useless. You can't use it for anything. Same is true of the atmosphere. But this, the differences that are important. So you gain available potential energy, and that can power the outward growth of the plateau, crustal extension within it, and enhance crustal shortening on the flanks. So that's the hypothesis. How can we test it? Well, it, this makes a number of predictions. You should have big lateral variations in density, which would manifest themselves as lateral variations in seismic wave speeds. You might get enhanced volcanism because you've thinned the lithosphere in here. You've brought hot material up underneath material that's, uh, well, we'll talk about that in a second. You'd expect more volcanism. Crustal thinning beneath the plateau, we've already talked about that. Outward growth of the range around the surroundings. And then you'd expect the, the surface elevation to go up when you drop this blob off, and then it would subside after that as you spread all this apart. Well, the, the evidence for lateral variations in, in the upper mantle are, are numerous. I'm just going to show you one example. PN speeds. PN is the P wave that travels just below the MOHO. And if it's a low speed, it's, we think it's hot. If it's a high speed, we think it's, we think it's cold. Uh, Northern Tibet in here has much lower speeds than southern Tibet or the surrounding areas up in here. So if you'll let me just say, if it's greater than 8.1 kilometers per second, it's cold and then it's dense. If it's less than 8.1, it's warm, and hence low density upper mantle. As I said, this is just one example. There's an abundance of this. What about, what about volcanism? Okay, this is a map showing fairly young volcanic rock. Most of this is potassium-rich volcanic rock. The yellow in northern Tibet, this is the youngest of this rock, not entirely the youngest, there's a three million year old age in here, but most of this is younger than 10 million years, there's a little bit 17 to 15 here. This, this red rock is also potassium rich, but northern Tibet has a lot of volcanism. And, and, and I emphasize this, if you drive across the area, uh, the, the amount of volcanic rock is not great, but the, the, the hilltops are capped with a thin layer of basalt. All that black stuff is basalt coming over here. It's been eroded out down in here. Turner, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, sample, uh, analyzed the chemistry of some of this volcanic rock. As I said, it's potassium rich. It's rich in other incompatible elements. It's also got a high strontium 87-86 ratio. Plotted on a neo delta neodymium, neodymium versus 87-86 in here. Crust, old crust is way over here, enriched in rubidium, lots of strontium 87. Morb is way up here, and Tibetan mantle Mantle volcanic rock. It's, it's basalt, so it it's, comes out of the mantle, lies in between in here. What, what Turner argued was that for a long time you had mantle lithosphere there. Potassium rich melt seeped into the mantle lithosphere. This was a paper of Dan's back uh, 30 years ago. And, and it, it comes in, it doesn't bring any heat because it's a small amount, but it's full of these incompatible elements, it's full of volatiles and it seeps in, metasomatizes the mantle. Then you stretch this, you thicken, so you stretch this column, 
taking it down deeper. And then when you remove the lower lithosphere, you wind up warming that potassium rich, that volatile rich mantle lithosphere down here, and you get the melts that are seen above. So enhanced volcanism, we see that in northern Tibet. Crustal thinning beneath the high plateau, well, we've seen that already. I don't, I don't want to dwell on, on this camembert or Tibet any further. Uh, what about the outward growth of the range? Okay, this, this next slide, you can't possibly digest it all. Uh, this is a map, obviously, with Tibet in the middle. It's showing places where recent abrupt changes, not recent, I shouldn't say that, but abrupt changes in something occurred somewhere between 15 and roughly 10 million years ago. Rapid cooling, which is presumably due to high erosion, presumably because the region went up. Rapid sedimentation, an abrupt increase in sedimentation in the surrounding areas, presumably erosion increased. This one's interesting. This is a 15 million year old foraminifera, marine sediment now at 1,500 meters high. That's a puzzle, how did it get in there? I don't want it to be wind blown, but we shouldn't <laughs> leave that possibility out. Uh, Baikal, the bottom of Baikal dropped out at this time. Most of these numbers go with observations that are not direct measurements of surface uplift at all, or deformation even, uh, but collectively that's what I'd like you to think. Uh, the, a good exception, though, of course, is the folding of the Indian Ocean floor down in here, which accelerated quite dramatically around eight million years ago. This has been known for some time from Jim Cochran's work. So, Outward growth of the range or plateau. Outward growth not only surrounding Tibet, but all the way into the Tian Shan, into Mongolia, and all the way to Baikal, as well as south of Tibet. Okay, uh, if you think I'm selling you a bridge um, between uh, two boroughs in New York, if you know that analogy, um, you may really think that now. What about increase in surface elevation followed by subsidence? Paleoaltimetry in Tibet is a burgeoning field. It's just fantastic, everything going on, but we have a long way to go. I picked out a recent study published this year by Ling Ding, Bob Spicer, and others. They were focused on sites within the, within the edge of the Himalaya, these two sites, and they show this abrupt increase in here. I don't want to, I don't want to take you there. I want, want you to look at this other line. These are sites mostly further north, out here in Dada, but also in central Tibet and Namling, this one in here, suggesting maybe a change in elevation, maybe not. The point I want to emphasize is that Namling, the paleo altitude that they got for this was well over 5,000 meters. The paleo altitude for Janda is nearly six kilometers, and today these places are down here. So these suggest a drop of 1,000 meters since 10 to 15 million years ago. Probably a better summary is Paleoaltimetry is not good enough yet to test the hypothesis that I'm trying to uh, uh, offer you. Okay, um, I, I, for me, uh, oh yeah, I just wanted to summarize with that. For me, uh, the exciting future of a lot of this is with, with climate, with paleoclimate. If you think about climate in the past, the most important boundary condition is the surface. Tectonics controls the surface, whether it's plate tectonics moving land masses around or internal deformation raising the surface. Seems to me this is a direction where we should be turning our attention. So I'm going to discuss one example of um, post 10 million year old um, climate change. This is a series of, of indices of climate. They're all time series. On the right is the present. Then the red lines are 5 million years ago, 10, 15, this one goes back more than 20 million years. And I just want to focus on one area, actually, the Lys Plateau in here. The Lys Plateau, where the Lys on the plateau, not further west, further west, Lys began, began a long time ago. But on the Lys Plateau, you had a big acceleration in Lys deposition beginning around 10 million years ago. Of course, your eye is struck to this big increase around 3 million years ago. That's climate change. That's ice ages. That, that's not the focus. Here, the data don't go there, but you would see that increasing. Here you see that. I want to talk about just 10 million years ago. So the first thing to do, of course, is understand where does the dust come from today? Oh, just a quick picture of the list. Uh, this is a photo of the list, beautifully layered and very well dated because the magnetostratigraphy is magnificent. The magnetostratigraphy is the same quality you have with marine records. 
not like most continental records. It's really gorgeous. And you can see when ice ages began, the red clay underneath is the end, and then, you be, then after that you get much more, much more arid conditions that follow. Okay, when does, when does dust come today in the modern world? These are plots, this is, these are monthly averages, so that's January, February, March, April, May, December over here, of two, two quantities. One is the dust outbreak frequency when you get big dust storms, and the, that's the bars down here, and high winds. In order to lift the dust, you need to have very strong winds, not just ordinary background winds. The, the black and the white are just two different periods of time, 93 to 2002, 2000 to 2002. And you can see that both the dust outbreaks and the strong winds are springtime phenomena. Not winter, not, not summer, and certainly not fall. Springtime, March, April, and May. So now I'm going to draw on work of, George, of uh, Gerard Rowe, who argues that what's going on is, uh, is Lee cyclogenesis. But before I get there, what he's shown here, let's look at this map first. This is, Tibetan is outlined in here. There's Mongolia. The Lis Plateau would be over here. This is the March, April, May climatology. The March, April, May average temperature at 850 millibars. That's about a kilometer and a half up in the atmosphere. And you'll all be surprised to see it's cold near the poles and it's warm down here near the equator. Then these six, these other six plots are days of big, big dust storms, some of the biggest dust storms in the past 50 years. And what you see is the cold air has come down and crossed Siberia, come in, gotten to Mongolia, gotten near the edge of Mongolia, gotten over, over in here. You have these big cold outbreaks that come when the dust storms come. That's, that's the, the big message that Gerard has here. To understand that, the proper meteorological way of saying this is you conserve potential vorticity, but let's just look at her. Uh, she conserves angular momentum. Potential vorticity is a way of looking at angular momentum. When you bring the, a column of air up over a mountain, you have to squash it vertically. It has to spread out. The air doesn't get compressed. When you bring it down, you, bring, you, you stretch that column so you contract its radius, and when she contracts her radius, of course, she spins up. The angular momentum is conserved. She's just changed her moment of inertia. That's not quite what potential vorticity is, but that's the basic idea. So when you come over the top of the mountains in Mongolia, you get least cyclogenesis, you get strong winds because you speed up, and you can then spin off very strong winds to lift the dust up into the air. If you look at where storms are seeded in this part of the world in that time of the year, March to May, up in here. They're seated up here in Mongolia. There's some are seated down in here coming off the, the jet stream that's coming around Tibet. But Tibet is way over here. So Tibet doesn't play an obvious role at all in these storms, though I'm, I'm not finished quite yet. So, so the storms are seated in Mongolia. Lee cyclogenesis seems to be the way to do it. There's the, where the Lee cyclogenesis occurs, the Lis Plateau, Tibet. And you can ask, is it irrelevant? No. Uh, what do I do? Right. So uh, I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, Paul Tapunier drew, drew this picture um, 40 years ago for a paper we did. And if you were to read the caption, you'd see that we, the caption doesn't say what I'm about to say, but I think it still works. So imagine you have a plateau that's high before collision. By 15 or 10 million years ago, you've built up the Himalaya, but you've also raised the plateau up higher. We, we look at Tibet as the pressure gauge of Asia. So you increase the pressure in here. Well, what happens is you get it high enough you can deform farther north. The Trim Basin in between is strong. So you, as the plateau lowers, as the pressure is, 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 uh, is decreases across Tibet, you still can cause, cause deformation further north in the Tian Shan. And then for completeness, we have east-west extension in Tibet. So you don't, uh, the amount of shortening across here uh, is greater than the, uh, uh, the, the amount of um, northward motion of the southern edge is, is uh, greater than the, um, the total amount of shortening because you're extruding material in here or you're getting it out of the way. So with that idea, I'd like to offer the rise of the Mongolian Altai and Gobi Altai as a geodynamic teleconnection from Tibet. Teleconnection is the word the climatologists use for for having a heat source in some part of the world and then seeing a response someplace else. El Nino writes a signature all around the globe because of teleconnections. Well, this is a geodynamic teleconnection. 
It's not as good as plate tectonics, but I, I think it's pretty good. <laughs> so, relationship of list deposition over North China to the Tibetan Plateau and its growth. Maybe many of you will say, well, there's obviously none at all. But I would argue, well, maybe there's a geodynamic connection. A rise of Tibet increased the pressure, or more properly, the force per unit length, that its lithosphere applied to Asian lithosphere farther north, which caused the Mongolian Altai and Gobi Altai to rise, and that made Lee cyclogenesis possible. Well, boredom is something I fear worse than death. So I've been trying to learn new stuff over the past 25 years, hoping that I could find a way to make Tibet important in, in uh, affecting um, paleoclimate in Asia. And all I can say, maybe this is advice to young people, <laughs> don't worry about failure. If you're having fun, just keep, keep doing it and go forward. Thank you. So spot on time as well, Peter. Congratulations uh, for the talk and that. Um, well, there was enough controversy there about things dropping off the uh, lithosphere or climate to uh, perhaps generate a question. Oh, no. Ah. Oh. Yeah. There. Could you could you kill the light as well? We'll just uh, we'll, we'll come back to you in a sec. Run you run it again. Tanya's arrived. So you're going to make the Himalaya. This goes in a little bit too far. Uh, I wasn't on top of this. There you go. One thrust fault, another thrust fault. You're building high peaks. Meanwhile, you're thickening crust back in here. And then you're dripping this stuff off, much to my delight. Uh, OK, so now watch Tibet thicken. One of the interesting things that we've learned, we other people have learned recently, is the whole of the plateau underwent deformation right after collision time. <coughs> Uh, so that although the thickening did migrate northward, the locus of most intense thickening probably migrated northward, uh, the whole of the plateau has been active for 40, 50 million years. And there goes this blob. There it goes. Uh, please don't call it delamination. I detest the word. <laughs> no, you didn't. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've been taught uh, recently very well. Um, so any questions? Oh, there was one here. Yes, sorry. Yeah. And you'll leave the microphone. Oh, uh, David Raoli. So uh, two comments about uh, aspects. One is the paleoaltimetry is an estimate of the mean height of the watershed. And so given topography, you will not get the basin height. You shouldn't get the basin height no matter what. Um, so the fact that they're above current does not intrinsically mean that the surface has come down. Uh, you're certainly right about Jada. You're not right about Bob Spicer's um, paleobotany, uh, which I know since you worked in the same place with the isotopes, uh, I won't tell you anymore. <laughs> but Spicer's, Spicer's don't, are not, don't suffer, but you are certainly right about the rest, yes. Um, there. <laughs> Quick question. That, that video helped clarify one of the questions I've always had. So to begin with, India was coming under, and it melted and de-blobbed, if you will. But then your de-blobbing under Tibet came from the other side. OK. So um, rather than delaminating as a symmetrical feature. So, so do you, Peter do you, Bird des described delamination as peeling away. Yeah, OK. Uh, and I, I'm, so you don't, I don't believe that happens. So that's why I don't like the word. Uh, what we've shown is for the Indian lithosphere going down, yeah, it, it presumably pieces break off after the collision occurs. I don't know if that's right. But the, the material that's removed, shown in Tanya's animation, is from southern Tibet for sure. Now, but it has a polarity to it. It was going well, south. Well, this is one of the problems with this. I'll take whatever I can get. Okay. If you can show me it de-blobs in some other way, I'll take it. I'm, I, I'm really agnostic on this. And I can imagine <laughs> lots of little blobs dropping off. You, you know, you paint the ceiling, lots of little drops of blobs. This looks like milky if it cow, helps I know. You. But, but of all the places in the world when you might consider de-blobbing or whatever, this to me is the, you know, the classic yeah, case. I mean, the yes, place, but I'm how it happens, I, I, I'm, I'll take what I can get. Authorities. 
Hi, Chris Mark, Trinity College, Dublin. Um, so just a couple of observations on your model that uh, rutile is fundamentally a metamorphic mineral. And if you look at the uranium lead, so the crystallization ages of rutiles in the Indus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra uh, systems, both in the detrital record and in modern river sediment, uh, you, very, you find very few ages younger than the mid-Miocene. So 13 million years, uh, 12 million years, 15 million years. And there's very little after that, apart from in the syntaxes and maybe a few parts of the Karakoram. So one possible simple uh, explanation for that is simply that we haven't had a great deal of high-grade metamorphism since that time. So that might tie in to your suggestion that we're starting to get orogenic collapse. And just to link, if you think about the Variscan origin, we think that uh, peak metamorphism was probably around 300 to 305 MA, and then certainly by 290 MA across Western Europe, you've got orogenic collapse and widespread magmatism. So that's about the same time frame. So 15 million years, uh, characteristic time frame for orogenic collapse? Um, uh, I don't want to put a number on that either. It, we've done numerical experiments looking at what the role of non-Newtonian viscosity is. And it's, it's really interesting. You, you see nothing with your eye. It's happening very slowly, and then it can go bang. And it all depends upon how much you perturbed it at the beginning. So if, if I take those, I believe most rock, particularly cold rock, is, is not Newtonian. If I take those calculations, I, I can tolerate any delay just about that you give me. If you want it 40 million years, I'll take it. If you want 10, I'll take it. Uh, I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm pretty open on all of this, <laughs> with a couple of exceptions. Okay. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll move on. The questions we'll pick up at the end of the session. Um, right. So we're now moving from the high, uh, high heights of Asia to the high Arctic of Canada, and uh, we have Randall Stevenson who's going to tell us about the Eurekan interplate orogenesis. Hi there. There is, there is precedent in this meeting that some of the older participants have been showing pictures of, the, of their younger selves, with the exception of uh, Cindy, who was one of the younger participants in the meeting. So this is me, 30 years ago approximately, on Ellesmere Island, when I worked for the Geological Survey of Canada. And you won't believe me when I say this, but I, what I'm actually thinking at that moment is that how much I would like to get a project going in which we could geophysically map out the structure of Ellesmere Island. At the time, I, I left shortly thereafter, came over to Europe, um, thereby becoming a citizen of nowhere, according to the language in the country at the moment. Um, and then about nine years ago, I moved to uh, the University of Aberdeen, and, imagine, and I managed to cajole a few quid out of them that allowed me to get up, back up to the high Arctic. And we set out a few seismometers with the help of uh, the Geological Survey of Canada, who allowed me to sort of jump on airplanes that were going anyway kind of thing. And a couple of years ago, we published the receiver functions that were the result of that work. And in the uh, in online first with the Geological Society of London um, special publication, Circumarctic Lithosphere Evolution, we published a couple more papers, including the main things that I'm going to show you today, which is an integrated structural, ge structural geophysical crustal scale cross section of the Eurekan origin on Ellesmere Island. <coughs> so we'll get there in a moment, I suppose. So I'm actually dreaming of my future, you know, my dream goal here, and I managed to do it, and I guess I can retire now. Um, just to make sure everybody knows where, we're, where we are, this is uh, Ellesmere Island, and we're going to look at a cross-section through here. Um, Nair Strait comes into this discussion for, for a little bit in a moment, and uh, on this diagram, it's not a geological or a geophysical diagram, but basically, you know, good old Earth was trying to produce um, a new ocean through here, gave up basically, so that's older than, than the, the North Atlantic. The North Atlantic, of course, went into this part of the Arctic Ocean. And uh, one of the things that was linked to that was uh, mo movements of Greenland, basically, either uh, no longer fixed to North American plate. And it was those rotations that led to this 
Cenozoic age is actually Paleocene, Eocene um, compression in this area, which is the Eurekan origin. So I hope I don't take too many minutes doing this, but this is just a very quick uh, geological history of the region. Um, basically, we had a Precambrian early Paleozoic continental margin of Laurentia. Uh, in the early Paleozoic, maybe even in the latest uh, Neoproterozoic, we had a uh, the Ellesmerian and, and precursor origins. It's roughly Caledonian equivalent, and there are models in which this is actually the Caledonian origin from the north, what is now the margins of the North Atlantic, sort of uh, peeling around the north end of, of Greenland. After that, we have this big sedimentary basin form, maybe a post-orogenic collapse. It's the sphere drop basin. After that, we had this part of the Arctic Ocean form. This is still not completely a matter of uh, consensus, but there's a lot more information now than there was um, some time ago. And basically, whatever sort of processes and whatever the geometry of those processes were that produced what is now the Amerasia Basin were maybe late Jurassic and Cretaceous age primarily. And then we had this, uh, what I mentioned, the interacting with the formation of the modern North Atlantic Ocean, the rotations of Greenland that gave us the uh, Eurekan orogeny. Um, this summarizes what I just said in a few words. Jim Chalmers is in the audience. Um, this is the work that he did with Gordon Oakey a few years ago. And basically, these are the, if I got this right, Jim, the, uh, the relative uh, motions of Canada, or the Laurentia in Greenland. And basically, it's when it changes quite abruptly there, it's when we go from a kind of a strike-slip relationship to more of a convergent relationship. And it's that period then which is the Eurekan orogeny. Um, this is the same thing summarized in a recent paper by Dersing et al. Um, and it just sort of shows you a little bit this northern motion of Greenland at this time and, and compressing what was there on Ellesmere Island at that time. And if, and, uh, if I didn't say it before, this Eurekan orogeny, of course, is, has correlatives, is, is also going on to northern Greenland. I was actually going to put in some more stuff. This is just some old things, plate tectonics meeting. And I actually made slides, and I pulled them this morning, of some work that people had done back in the 1980s um, with respect to this sort of near strait controversy, if some of you may be aware of. But you know, those were such bad papers, I decided, that I didn't want to embarrass the authors. You know, some of them are well-known people. So, <laughs> so I decided to pull them out. But this is, this is just a little bit of historical context. Um, back in the 1970s, actually, mainly, I guess it was uh, Srivastava, um, basically did what Chalmers and Oki did more recently, looking at the available magnetic striping and plate tectonics, and came up with a kind of reconstruction that looked a little bit um, like this. I think it's from his paper as well. So Nair Strait was quite big, and, but the geophysics was saying that there had to be a big uh, lateral displacement along Nair Strait of maybe up to 300 kilometers. But the geology, although we don't have a very good picture of it here, was saying that the geology, key geological markers were not particularly offset across Nair Strait. So that was the big Nair Strait controversy. Lying behind that, of course, is that nobody knew too much about the magnitude and style of the deformation on Ellesmere Island itself, or for that matter, up here in, in the Eurekan part of that world. Um, the magnitude and the, and the, you know, whether it was, uh, and how it happened, that deformation. Over the decades since then, it, uh, certainly everybody qualitatively appreciated the fact that this deformation and the, the, uh, the space that needed to be made up by whatever Greenland was doing with respect to North uh, Ellesmere Island was going to be partly involved in a th sort of three-dimensional distribution of strain rather than just purely a... Uh, um, a, a two-dimensional uh, shortening. So we'll come back briefly to that later, but I do want to just make sure we get through everything. It's still green, I see. And um, this, uh, this was sort of the state of the geophysics in the area. Maybe you can't see everything else. Island is here, more or less. Uh, this is from uh, this paper that Gordon Oki, who was a PhD student at the time, um, and I did. And um, it's just representing the fact that there was gravity data, this is actually an inversion for Moho depth. And there was a few scattered uh, seismic refraction lines in marine settings. And there was a couple of receiver functions published um, for a couple of stations that are on Ellesmere Island, actually. So off we went in 2010 
We managed to uh, hitch rides on this airplane, as you can see, and, and land in places that were interesting to land in. And uh, we set up some, some, some seismic stations. I, I, meant, I, sh I have to say that these, the seismic kit was from Size UK, and it didn't cost anything. Unlike today, if you want to use Size UK instruments, you basically have to pay a rental fee, which is greater than the cost of a brand new seismic instrument, I'm told, at least. So here we are. I was planning, I was thinking of possibly putting my hat on, because I've got my hat with me in my bag there, just to prove that it really is me. But um, uh, here we are at Alexandria Fjord, and we set up seven of these things. And uh, we didn't get, uh, of course, we didn't get any data during the winter when the sun was down. And this particular station uh, recorded for about three, three and a half months until a polar bear wrecked it. And, uh, <laughs> And actually, I don't know what the people in Leicester thought about the solar panels when we brought them back with the, uh, with the polar bear teeth marks in them. So Christian Schiffer, PhD student, now a postdoc at Durham University, did the uh, receiver function calculations. And here they are. And I'm not going to say anything more about that uh, in any detail. But these were then inverted to produce velocity structure for the crust and upper mantle. And that's what you see here. Uh, you see there's some back azimuths, so there's a little bit, there's a little bit of uh, information, lateral information. The colors are extrapolated, and then there is a, a geological interpretation of those colors. Um, this is the same picture, except that since we have some VP and VS information from the inversion on these things, we assign densities to it. And now I'm going to show you the crustal structure model. Um, this is... Uh, Basically, it's going to be finally a gravity model, but using that receiver function constrained um, velocity model converted to densities to provide a starting model. These are the gravity data, and you see that the, there's, that's where the profile is going to be. And you see that the gravity field is quite simple. There's quite a big low here associated with the frontal part of the Eurekan origin. There's a big high associated with um, a rather Eurekan stable area and then a, a gravity anomaly associated with a high topography here up in northern Ellesmere Island. For the gravity modeling, I took a geological cross-section, so basically the surface geology, uh, produced by these uh, guys from BGR, the German Geological Survey in Hanover, uh, Karsten Pipion and his colleagues. To, uh, I, that was not included in the gravity model, but it provided a geological boundary condition, and it's on the image. And we'll see how that works. And although they were making cross-sections, structural cross-sections, in a number of places, they projected that all onto almost exactly the same, kind of coincidentally, actually, onto the same uh, cross-section that, that uh, Christian and I had projected the receiver function data onto. So there is the, um, this is the crustal structure model, the final one. And... Um, if you can't read those numbers, basically we have some layers of upper mantle, some high velocity lower crust, some lower crust, some upper crust, and a metasedimentary layer, and a non, and a, and a less, and a more sedimentary sedimentary layer. The gravity model up here that is in blue uh, was, was exactly the gravity signature of this thing. And so we tweaked it ever so slightly. Basically, we had to thicken this uh, high velocity lower crust here and do one or two other things. So the tweaks are in red, and we end up with rather good regional scale um, cross-section. Then, using the geological boundary condition at the surface, I sort of plugged on these faults. Now, Pipion had tried very hard to work out um, faults that were active during the Eurekan orogeny rather than this precursor Ellesmerian orogeny took it back in the Paleozoic. And the reds here are Eurekan and the blues are are what are Paleozoic according to this. Of course, where I've drawn these things exactly is a little bit unconstrained. I'm just interpolating up to match the kinematics at the surface, basically. And then very quickly, just to say a few words about some of these um, elements of Ellesmere Island over here in segment one. This is a, an allochthonous terrain thought to be, um, but we don't see a lot of um, variation across that, given our resolution. Uh, there is a... a, a a strike slip fault there of Eurekan has certainly been reactivated in the Eurekan. The main story is in segment two, I would say. This um, pop up structure here, which is the northern, uh, northern Ellesmere Island, the highest topography, uh, it looks like that. And I would say that's a pretty typical way that an interplate 
origin, or if you don't want to call it an origin, we could call it an inversion, or anyway, whatever word you like. But this sort of crustal scale pop-up structure, we do see these things elsewhere. And uh, the basic geometry is, is similar to what has been seen in some other places as well. Uh, so that's, that's how an interplate orogeny basically looks. Now, in the case of the Eurekan orogeny, there's some sort of detachment down here. I mean, that, that's got nothing to do with the geophysics in a sense. There's no Eurekan deformation in this area. Uh, Pre-Eurekan sediments are flat-lying and undisturbed. But this um, fold belt, foreland fold belt out in the, uh, uh, the, the southern part of the Eurekan... Um, I didn't mean to give you a finger when I said that. But the deformation, the stacking of these thrusts out in the central Ellesmerian fold belt is actually Eurekan age, or thought to be mostly Eurekan age. So that is basically, well, there's the other segments that I've already talked about. So this is a little bit of a summary. I think there's maybe tens of kilometers, a hundred kilometers. Um, Jim is here, he can comment on that with respect to the kinematics if he wants to. Uh, but it is still very difficult to separate the Ellesmerian and early shortening in this story. Um, the brilliant uh, Hugh Balko, way back in the 1970s, reckoned that there was 80 kilometers of shortening. But generally over the years, this idea of two or 300 kilometers of shortening across the Eureka Neurogeny has, uh, has took some uh, form. And, and just, uh, just recently, there's a paper published by these guys they're from the University of Sydney group, so uh, Dietmar Müller uh, people. They did uh, G-plates reconstruction of this area. I reviewed the first version of this paper. I politely pointed out to them that the Geophysical International, uh, Geophys that journal, the, <laughs> the one that Cindy used to edit, or still does, that we had actually published this new crustal structure information for the Ellesmere Island, and they politely decided to ignore that when they revised the paper. But um, this is quoting from that paper. The model requires significant shortening in this area of the foreland fold and thrust belt. Um, and that compared to 20 or 30 kilometers estimated from quite careful palinspastic reconstructions done by a uh, geologist whose name is Christopher Harrison at the Geological Survey. And then they go on to say this discrepancy may be an, uh, may be an overestimation of Ellesmerian shortening or underestimating Eurekan shortening. And it took me a little while to think about what that meant. But what it means, actually, is that they are saying that the mistake is in the geology, not in their model. <laughs> and, and I've read the paper several times. And the starting situation, the amount of space they need to close, seems to be somewhat, uh, and then they close it. So their amount of shortening is actually based on the initial condition of their model. But nevertheless, the geology should be repaired. And that brings me to, the, uh, to my final slide. Beautiful painting from Ellesmere Island by one of the group of seven. Um, I put the question mark at the end just as a little bit of an optimistic note. Thank you very much. So we'll tolerate one question quicker than this. To so um, I guess their, their model is probably constrained by uh, plate tectonics in the, in the surrounding um, oceanic basins. Uh, my question is uh, basically, do you, do you know of any, to combine the two models, you'd probably need um, a convergent boundary uh, to the north of the Ellesmere Island. Um, does the receiver function show anything like this uh, with, the, with the, the boundary of the Arctic Ocean? Um, the, the people, have I'll be brief. Uh, people have discussed that possibility. But generally speaking, most of the structures that are in the ocean, or which may not be ocean, actually, according to many people now, uh, offshore, are mostly transtensional or extensional structures associated with this opening of the Canada Basin and its connection over into Eurasian Basin in the North Atlantic. But let's not forget that this is really a three-dimensional um, story of deformation as well. Thank you. Okay, so from the Arctic, we're going back to Central Asia, or to northern Central Asia, the Gobi Desert, and uh, Ethan Cunningham, who's going to tell us about uh, mountain building and uh, continental interiors, but non craterized continental interiors. Okay, thank you very much. So I changed my title slide this morning yes. because I wanted to emphasize the importance of geological fieldwork and ground truth. Because when we look at the uh, northern deformation field north of Tibet associated with the Indo-Eurasia collision, 
It is really impossible to fully understand the distribution of reactivation, the style of mountain building, the types of faults and their kinematics, and the earthquake hazards throughout the region if you don't document the preconditions, the geological preconditions, the context. It wasn't a blank template. And that's really the prevailing theme, what I want to talk about um, as we go forward here. So um, we had a really interesting introduction to this region. I'm going to move north from uh, where Peter Molnar talked, where I've been working 19 of the last 23 summers in this area, um, be between northern Tibet and the Hangai Dome. So let's just remind ourselves oh God, of the deformation field huge. It would swallow up Europe. It extends all the way to the Stanovoy. And uh, this is a view looking west. Okay, so here's north, and here's the Mongolia-Chinese border. This is what I call the Gobi Corridor. It's about 800 kilometers wide. And uh, it can be subdivided into different deforming and topographic domains, North Tibetan Foreland and Heshi Corridor, the Beishan Plateau with its northern and southern culmination, both uh, potentially still active in terms of uh, some of the faulting here. And then um, the easternmost Tian Shan, which extends into the southern Gobi Altai. This is a continuous deforming region here. And then the northern Gobi Altai here, where most of the action is today. I'm going to focus on some geological field results from two key areas in the short amount of time I have. So uh, this is information that's been known since the 1970s, really, about the, um, the, the earthquake seismicity and the active deformation in this area, in that we have clustered seismicity here in the northern Gobi Altai, the big magnitude 8.1 1957 earthquake, some other earthquakes in the southeast Gobi Altai, not too much in the Tangier Desert, not so much in the Beishan today. Um, notice the uh, velocity field shows these northeast to east, west, even southeast directions of displacement. There's a scale. Um, and we have some data in Mongolia also showing more east, west um, directions of displacement in, from Eric Calais' work. Um, the maximum horizontal stress direction throughout this area is northeasterly. It's been well documented also by Peter Molnar and others through the years that the active, uh, well, the Holocene fault scarps throughout the region, uh, the Gobi Altai earthquake uh, with this spectacular faulting in the northern Gobi Altai, but other fault scarps in the Altai less well studied, some in the Beishan that I don't know if anyone's looked at that are obvious on Google Earth, um, and some others in uh, the Tian Shan that we've looked at, and some others in the Gobi Altai too. So there's actually quite a lot of Holocene deformation and late quaternary deformation. And we know the timing of reactivation because uh, the quaternary, the alluvial fans are topographically smooth compared to the older Mesozoic sediments in many of these Gobi Altai basins. They show up very clearly on the digital topography. And, they've been, and they, they, they are the direct record of uplift of these big um, basement blocks. Um, typically, we see this quartet of geomorphic indicators of linear or, or low mountain front sinuosity. Uh, steep incised canyons debouching their sediments in these fan complexes. Often the fans are faulted or tilted or dragged. Okay, and based on cosmogenic nuclide dating and also um, some paleontology and some old Russian paleontology, we know that these fan deposits are, dom are dominantly Pliocene to recent, a few places in Miocene. But um, this is really the record of rejuvenation, as Peter was talking about, north of Tibet, um, really in the last, in the Pliocene to recent. The area is famous for its flat top summits. These mountains are so juvenile, they haven't yet been eroded into jagged summits. So we have these incredible peneplains that are, like, uh, that are tilted or are not so tilted, but often the fault responsible for uplifting them is visible along the front. Sometimes it's stepped out into the local foreland. This is what it looks like on the ground. So these are very young um, summits or uplifted blocks. And um, the peneplain is Cretaceous to Paleogene although it's slightly controversial how old it is. So what this shows is faults active in the quaternary that bound and cut quaternary deposits. This is not necessarily faults that are active today. This is in the last 1.8 million years or so. And uh, what it shows is that we have a wide array of uh, thrust faults and strikes of faults. The thrust faults typically are northwesterly striking, and the strikes of faults more east-west. But together, throughout this region, they resolve into a sinister transpressional array over a very wide area. It does challenge our assumptions about forward extrapolation of fault slip rates when there are so many faults that are potentially active and tectonic loading may be shared over so many faults. Um, it's very different than an interplate uh, setting, and this has, of course, been argued for the 2,000 years earthquake record in China and how faults appear to go dormant and reactivate throughout um, 
tectonically active regions of China. So it's not a new idea. So when we look at this region, intraplate, hyper arid to hyper arid, 50 to 200 millimeters a year of rain. There are no river outlets anywhere in this image. The only sediment that's stripped out is, as Peter was telling us, by aeolian deflation, by wind, contributing to the Tangier Desert, huge dune fields down here in the Chinese Lus Plateau. Okay, um, the amount of uplift um, is somewhat constrained by these summit peneplains. The flanking bajadas of alluvium um, provide an, a, a timing constraint. This is, going, this is no longer working. So I've lost the point here, but the flanking um, alluvial fans provide some constraint on the uh, timing of uplift. Uh, the key point, though, is the last one. There's a very strong tectonic signal in the landscape. It really jumps out. OK, so let me see. Now, if I could get another pointer, it would be great. There's a pointer coming. Great. So uh, what we, one thing we should notice here, though, is that this area of the Gobi Corridor is sandwiched between Great, thank you. So what we have here under Hangai is the Zalfan Bajrak Bluff. These are actually you have Archean basement, um, and this is and the and what we have here is the Altaids or Central Asian Orogenic Belt Terrain Collage, sandwiched between the Eastern Tarim and Al Shin North China blocks with their Archean Cratonic basement. And what you see here are the uh, mapped terrain boundaries in Mongolia and in China. The black lines are the opulite decorated suture zones with the interpreted former direction of subduction polarity. So. Um, what you see here is that the reactivated area is this Paleozoic terrain collage dominantly. And uh, it's part of the big terrain collage, the strip that runs right through Central Asia, and the largest, or one of the largest Phanerozoic continental growth factories on Earth. So just compare and contrast that with North America with its strong cratonic core and the, and the bordering uh, Phanerozoic orogenic belts. Asia's different. It has a terrain collage cutting right through the center. And that has to be a first order control in the reactivation of this region. Now, what about the amalgamation history of this big terrain collage? We're talking about this area, but it is important to note that the last two oceans that closed here were the Salonker Ocean and the Permian, and um, as North China rotated northwards, and, and the Mongol Alcots Ocean here, and uh, in the Jurassic. And there, there are the cratons, and I'm just going to throw this out. The, the final closure here, this sort of crocodile jaw closure, that um, is also where the Hangai Dome is, is today. The last ocean to close, the last slab to founder, and this big, and there's the big Mongolian orocline, and that's where we see the pyrogenic uplift today. I'll let you speculate on if there's any causality there. All right, so now let's look at the Gobi Altai. It has a basin range physiography, but it's a transpressional basin range. And I'm just going to summarize what we see there. Thrust faults break out to the north and south. Okay, there's no orogenic hinterland of foreland. Okay, um, this, is, this does not apply. The highest peaks in the region are restraining bends that are joining along strike and coalescing. Um, thrust faults typically reactivate the basement grain, the metamorphic fabric, uh, previous faults and sedimentary strike belts and magmatic arc trends. Strikes of faults appear to ignore it. I can show you many examples of that. So the question is, what were the preconditions here? We see many areas where the Cretaceous sediments and Cretaceous lavas are elevated, topographically inverted, and being stripped out. They're sitting high and dry. So how do these, how do these depot centers get pushed up? And one of the things we wanted to document were the preconditions here in the northern Gobi Altai. So I'm going to look at two case studies here quickly. Um, and so here's Iqbal, okay, the 1957 rupture zone along the northern front. But behind it, you see this topographic compartment. And that's a normal fault scarp there. And let's look, look at that now. So this is within that compartment, looking east. And you can see these monoclinal flexures and these normal faults. These are Cretaceous normal faults. And here's the rear bounding fault. You can see the uh, basin word dipping slick in size with the down, dominantly down dip slick in lines. These are Cretaceous red beds. So the basic story here is that within this restraining bend, here's the modern deformation zone with a pop-up. This cross section here shows the preserved bounding normal fault and the monoclines here. So this is a rift, a Cretaceous rift that's passively, the rift margin passively uplifted in this modern restraining bend. And if we go further east towards Bagabog, then the propagating northern margin or northern uh, front of the, of the northern Gobi Altai, there's this big deflection of the Angi River because there's a, a very long anticline that's growing here that's inverting this half graben. And as we go further west, we also see that there is this half graben that's now much more inverted, and the neogene sediments are buckled here. You can see the growth strata. And so we have the Valley of Lakes here, this older rift province, which is being inverted. And this is that gentle fold at the surface that's bagger in the distance. 
So what we see here in the preconditions was this was a rift province. And then when we get down to southern Gobi Altai Benemeg branch here, which is a big restraining bend along the Gobi Tian Shan Fault system. And here you can see looking west with the alluvial fans on both margins here. Okay, here's this big surfboard peneplain rising out of the subsurface of the Cretaceous sediments being stripped out. And here's the frontal thrust on the southern side. And it's a beautiful thrust fault further along and overthrust these uh, Neogene to recent, some places, Cretaceous uh, fan conglomerates. And here's the northern front. And you can see the Paleozoic, uh, these are garnet and biotite schists. Um, and there's the fabric, which is reactivated. And the youngest gravels here are actually thrusted along the northern front. So both sides are being thrusted. Um, but when we went to the western end of the range, we were surprised to see these basement domes. And um, we didn't expect to find these. And they're actually bound by normal faults. And um, this looks like onlap. It's somewhat like a shallow metamorphic core complex variant. So when we zoom in there, this is the boundary between basement and the uh, Cretaceous sediments. And you can see this flattening and shear fabric. When we zoom in on it, these are these Devonian phyllites that wrap back over themselves because the Cretaceous sediments have slid off. And here's another one of these exhumed foot walls. Looks a little bit like a turtle back, very recently exhumed and not very gullied at all. That's the bounding fault again, dipping basinward. So this is, again, part of the extensional history of the Gobi Altai, the Cretaceous extensional history. And um, it's only because of this recent uh, restraining bend along this big fault system that we see the exhumation of these turtlebacks and this, this older rift history. So what we now can say is that the, the, the Mongolia-China borderland is this very diffuse rift province, well documented for the, these, a lot of oil-bearing basins here, Songliao, early on basins, all the way down towards Ordos, some metamorphic core complex is also documented. But in the Gobi Altai, we see that uh, we see the same thing. But it's just overprinted by all the transpression, most recent transpression. It's harder to see. And this is really a very wide, diffuse extensional province that succeeded the final closure of the Paleoasian and Mongol Alcuts oceans. The whole area went into extensional collapse. So those were preconditions before the late Cenozoic reactivation. And in the uh, late Cretaceous to early tertiary, there was a lot of volcanism in the northern Gobi Altai. This may have also predisposed the northern Gobi Altai to some uh, thermal weakening and later reactivation. That's quite speculative. The final point is that underneath the Hangai Dome, we have these Archean basement blocks. Everyone always talks about the Siberian Craton. But here we have these uh, good zircon geochronology. A lot more data has just come out in the last year. Alfred um, Kroner's group at Mainz with these uh, good Archean zircon ages. And so what we can say is the Gobi Altai is a sinistral transpressional, OK, sinistral transpressional deformation. Uh, the Altai dextral, they're, they're topographically joined but kinematically separate. And um, if we overlay that previous figure and stretch it out to have the same map projection, uh, this is acting as a backstop or a passive indenter, whatever you want to call it, focusing deformation in the Altai um, to the west and southwest and to the south. That is the first order control on the kinematics also. Okay, so this is my final slide. But if you look at the angular relationship between the pre-existing basement trends the maximum horizontal stress driven by India's continued indentation. It resolves to a dextral transpressional system here with reactivation of that basement fabric and a sinistral uh, transpressional system here. This is sort of a cartoon. And that's the first order control on the kinematics of these mountain ranges. These mountain ranges are not like any type of mountain range you'll see in any structural geology or tectonics textbook. They're a completely different kind of animal. So I'm not going to read all these. Uh, I think this is the most most interesting final point. These types of intercontinental oblique deformation belts will have uh, may be lost in the rock record unless you're looking for a younger class of brittle structures, unconformity, some clastic sediment record, maybe some uh, low temperature thermochronometry. Um, but they may they may be elusive in the rock record, and many may still await discovery. So I'll finish with that. Thank you. For one sharp question, if someone's interested in this um, really oh, interesting news. Hello, quickly, Mike. Yeah, um, yeah. Dixon, the, the um, Cretaceous volcanics, so they're, they're if they're contemporary with the Cretaceous extension, they come at the earlier stages of can it. You use, um, uh, can you use any tilting of them to reconstruct the orientation of those turtleback faults at the time they were active? You could. I think, um, yeah, you, you could. Um, Although there's been a lot of modification since, you know. So, you know, there's. You've got a paleo horizontal, but you've got, 
the extensional record and then the, the reactivation. So you've got two phases of deformation to try to, to that will be um, additive. So that, that's a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. I would say something, something that's interesting is that the Gobi Altai crust is now thickened back up. It averages about 42 kilometers thick. So despite this extensional record at the surface, uh, we, it's, a thick, it's not so thin. There's nothing like the baseline range in the, you know, North America today. So what, what is the process where it thickened back up, which is in, in, an interesting question. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So, we're now changing continents, we're going to Africa. Uh, and East Africa, and where there is apparently a revolution going on according to Chris here. So we look forward to uh, hearing that. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm very glad, uh, pleased and honoured to be here and to uh, renew acquaintance with Dan McKenzie after 30 or something years after um, his visit to Cape Town. Um, the revolution was in 1967. I, I, this is Thomas Kuhn paradigm shift. That's where it is. Um, and so, um, and I, I, I happened to come across this quote in the book by Peter Watson, Terrible Beauty. Ideas that shape the modern mind, and uh, I'll let you read that. But the, the final sentence there, relating to the ideas of continental drift and plate tectonics, is that this is perhaps the crowning achievement of 20th century thought. So um, um, I'm somewhat um, reminded of Hank Frankel's remarks about ineligibility of a geophysicist for Nobel Prizes, but um, um, there it is. Um, this is the outline of my talk. I'm just going to squick, quickly skip over the precursors to the, uh, the paradigm shift or revolution. And in particular, I'm going to focus on, I, it's an Afrocentric point of view that I'm adopting. That, that's in my title. It's also in the, 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 uh, my cover slide from um, Jason Morgan. Um, and uh, it's the evolution from the ideas of Mackenzie, Davies, and Molnar in 1970 through to essentially the present day. And the importance of, one, the uh, computer technology um, that came in around about uh, 1963, Alan Smith and so on, and also then the uh, integration of space geodesy with the earthquake slip vector idea. So that's essentially uh, it. And then a little bit about the, uh, the uh, dynamic uh, implications of this. And finally, um, the seismic hazard aspects and, uh, and a little bit about an event that happened earlier this year. So being African and South African, of course, I, I, I have to refer to uh, my compatriot, 1937, the book, Our Wandering Continents. Um, I've just illustrated over here the, um, uh, this, this one doesn't work, sorry. Uh, 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 page 113, this diagram, is, which essentially shows the match of Africa and South America with, I guess, what we would call on a fault-scale piercing point uh, reconstructions of matching features on either side of the South Atlantic. That's uh, a geologist's point of view there. The other thing I'd point out was Alex de Toy, probably on the 50th anniversary of our wandering continents, had a stamp uh, created in his honour. So um, just an idea for the Royal Mail. Uh, we could have the uh, Pacific thing and the visage of Dan McKenzie on a British stamp, but uh, um, there you are. <laughs> um, the, um, of course, the key role, this has been shown a number of times, the uh, Bullard, Everett and Smith uh, reconstruction. And again, I, I, I'm also deeply saddened by the fact that Alan Smith isn't here. Um, we first met in 1979 for a month in January 1989. We were on a we shared the bow cabin on the uh, Polar Duke on a trip between Patagonia and, and West Antarctica, and there were some others in the audience like Aldridge Moores and Victor Ramos who were on that ship as well, also Dixon. Um, uh, but the key thing, of course, is Africa, again, uh, played a central part in this reconstruction. And here, of course, we have Jason Morgan's um, uh, African plate as first defined, with, of course, the East African rift system uh, shown in there. Um, and uh, uh, then, of course, coming back to uh, Smith and Hallam with the, uh, and again, it's, a, it's the quantification of Gondwana land, the, uh, the reconstruction. And we are aware, of course, that um, this was a loose, what, what are these days is called a loose fit. We know, for example, that this big area of southern Mozambique is probably a delta, delta area from the Paleo Limpopo, which rivals 
um, which in fact dwarfs the Niger Delta. Uh, and of course, there were big problems with the overlap of the Antarctic Peninsula here, which um, uh, again, uh, that's another thing which has a whole spin-off story in Victor Ramos. Uh, uh, knows a lot about this, the whole problem of the Falkland Islands and so on. Uh, so this is coming to the key point in 1970 now with uh, this paper, and I've uh, extracted the, uh, the key diagram, the first definition of the Nubian and Somalian and Arabian plates around that triple junction. Uh, and of course, the use of earthquake slip vectors, uh, a, a rather few of them in this area to define a pole of rotation between um, Nubia and Somalia. Uh, and again, I, I've extracted this quote over here, which probably you won't be able to read because of its side, but the, the concepts of plate tectonics can be useful where plates are separating at millimeters a year, uh, and the total relative motion of which has been between 30 and 300 kilometers. So uh, that, that whole idea is something that we picked up, up on. But of course, it took a long time for that to be realized again in a quantitative sense, because you come um, to the Nouvelle One model in 1990, uh, and I, I think, as far as I recall, Chuck de Metz was the person in charge of Africa for this, this modeling. And uh, in this paper, he acknowledges that he tried hard, but he couldn't actually get a stable solution uh, for the, the Nubia Somalia issue in this plate. Uh, the, there was something called the Shudovsky slip vector uh, data set, which he'd been trying hard with um, publication by Gordon Shudovsky in 1985, I think it was. Um, but of course, if you're dealing with a, a somewhat distributed deformation, uh, you can't expect uh, uh, the earthquake slip vectors to line up easily if you have local blocks uh, rotating independently. I think Richard has made this point a little bit earlier this afternoon. I got involved. Uh, shortly after there'd been a, a, a substantial magnitude five and a half earthquake in that region of South Africa um, and which focused uh, people's attention. And, and this was something I'd suggest. I'd also been a few years earlier involved with Bob Fisher and Jim Natland and others on an expedition from the Detoy fracture zone, which is that one over here, up this very, this huge fracture zone, which on that expedition we named the Andrew Bain fracture zone through up to about this region over here. And so I was quite familiar, having spent uh, a lot of time in the logs look, uh, looking over the seismics and so on. And in particular, we, when we were tracking up the Andrew Bain fracture zone, we somewhat got lost over here because of complexities in that region, which I then thought back in 1984 could be a potential triple junction between Nubia and Somalia and something else. In this paper, I. Uh, indicated that there was what I called an ambiguous region uh, somewhere between Nubia and Somalia along the southwest Indian ridge there. So um, this is the uh, uh, paper where space geodesy became involved. Um, at the time, about the time that this was published, I was on my way to uh, a conference on an entirely different matter in uh, uh, Death Valley, California. I, uh, okay, I, um, we, we'll skip over that. The story is basically Jason Morgan had me gate crash uh, at the dynamics of the solid earth uh, meeting. Um, and uh, I think uh, Richard uh, Gordon probably remembers this. But here we have the, the wide plate boundary zone between Nubia and Somalia as represented in 1992. I, about a decade later, I revised that. There's the original pattern into something which I considered uh, a, a pattern between a seismic blocks, this stands for uh, Rewe Nianza, um, otherwise known as the Victoria microplate, Revuma, and something possibly over here, and these were indicated in brackets, the Luandli and Transgari plates. So that's the situation as it evolved. Uh, since then, um, we have, an, in fact, together with Eric Calais and, this, and, and Cindy Ebinger, um, that was as a result of a, a conference in Ethiopia, uh, put together a model which initially uh, uh, integrated GPS and earthquake slip vectors uh, to uh, show uh, relative motions about six or seven millimeters up here, coming down to less than a millimeter per year down over here, with two independent blocks, the Victoria and Ravuma. Um, subsequently, um, Sarah Stamps, Eric, uh, um, Eric's uh, PhD student, 
produce this uh, model in which, and, and this is significant, so the Victoria Nubia, uh, the Victoria block is rotating clockwise around about that pole, the Ravuma block is rotating, sorry, anti-clockwise there, clockwise for Ravuma, and then the problem of what happened over here in this, Lewandli is a, a causal word meaning ocean, so this essentially is the ocean plate between these two. Um, here you have the Somalia Nubia pole, uh, here you have the Lewandli Somalia pole, and in this particular model, the uh, Lewandli Nubia pole is somewhere out there on the great circle between those three. What we have subsequently realized is that, in fact, these three poles are probably much closer together. The actual Lewandli Nubia pole is somewhere around here, uh, very close to an earthquake, which Emilio Carl has, a 1975 event, which has been shown to be a, a thrust event. Uh, and, and likewise, the Lewandli Somalia pole is probably up here. And so you have a very tight cluster of three rotation poles. Um, and, and that pretty much uh, uh, describes uh, uh, what is going on also in the, uh, the Capricorn India plate um, area as well. So this is the uh, 2010 model. And then things have been integrated since. Um, the, the, the most recent uh, is the integration of the... Uh, the, the marine data along the Southwest Indian Ridge with the GPS data and the earthquake quake slip vector to, uh, to show this model. I, of course, disagree with this particular trajectory of the nubia lewandli boundary. I believe it does go on land, and this is where we come to what is going on the earthquake hazard. How many more minutes have I got? You've got three. Three, okay, good. Um, Earlier this year, we had a magnitude 5 earthquake in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. Absolutely flat, no sign of neotectonics or anything. And uh, it was widely felt in Johannesburg. It occurred actually in the evening after a fairly substantial mining-induced earthquake uh, in the Stolfontein area. And so it attracted quite a bit of attention. Uh, this is uh, Mustafa Magrahi's uh, seismic tectonic map of Africa. And this is uh, something he provided me with showing... Uh, what has been, it, it was an extensional event. Uh, they've had a, an array over here which has shown that there is seismicity arcing around the belt over here, but most of the aftershocks cluster in that area, corresponding about to a magnitude, moment magnitude, six and a half event. Um, the, the implications of this now, of course, we, we then went look back and looked at the GPS data uh, and we, we noticed in the 2013 paper that there was some kind of anomalous uh, strain rate of, of an order of magnitude higher than most of the, the Trignet system in South Africa. Um, and, and we thought, well, is this an indication that there was, in fact, something being prepared there? Uh, we've since gone back and looked at the data. Uh, we've looked at the, uh, the stress patterns, the world stress map data, and there's a distinct boundary between what I call now trans stress province and the Cape stress province, normal faulting, strike slip faulting, <coughs> roughly that orientation of horizontal stress, more or less east-west horizontal stress uh, down over here. What we see is that all of this, even across these seismic belts, scattered seismicity which separates these stress provinces, uh, the plate there is effectively rigid. The only part where we now see uh, strain rates, and this goes up to nearly 10 uh, nanostrains per year, uh, is the, the Richards Bay thing, which seems to be moving off uh, in, uh, just to quickly throw that uh, out, uh, a velocity of about a millimetre a year, which is set, uh, relative to stable nubia, which essentially is uh, the, the hypothesised Lewandli plate uh, velocity in, for that area. So I, I do believe that the boundary between these two plates does come on land in South Africa here. Also, that we can exclude the, the Peter Bird boundary, which passes much further inland. So uh, that's the, and of course the, the comparisons, and I'll just quickly go over here between that area where you have the largest strike-slip earthquake, essentially within the largest stress anomaly on the planet, the second largest stress anomaly on the planet, very similar, and in 1850, there was an earthquake there which in Kosa is described as I in Yikama, which means the shaking, uh, felt almost all over southern Africa, probably related to a magnitude 8-ish earthquake in that region uh, at that time. That's our, 
our belief at the moment. So these are the important conclusions. Uh, quantification of Nubia Somalia took a long time. It did require the integration of these different, uh, both technologies and, and ideas and techniques. Uh, there is still, in Richard Gordon's terms, an African composite plate because everything is quite dynamically strongly coupled, particularly in the south. Um, and this, of course, has significant seismic tectonic uh, implications. Uh, ultra slow motions, mostly in that region. Uh, possibility of magnitude eight events, because that has been a, a very controversial project uh, or, or proposal in, in South African seismic tectonics. And then, of course, the use of GPS and so on in mapping these stress and strain regimes and uh, relating them to uh, seismic hazard. So that's. So we could uh, we could manage one quick question if anybody has one. Bruce. Chris, how much of some of the location could also be an effect of interaction between some of the basement structures uh, and any of the younger stuff? Like yeah, the, the control. Uh, yeah, in terms of controlling just, location. Just to mention that, that earthquake... Um, sorry, should I be closer to the microphone here? Uh, uh, there, there are obviously ba the basement controls over a wide, large parts of the East African roof system, but that particular earthquake actually is, occurred directly on uh, a, a paleo terrain boundary between a paleo proterozoic terrain, the aqua terrain, and the Limpopo belt, an Archean part of the Limpopo belt. So clearly, with that particular intraplate earthquake, uh, which, for which there's no sign of any previous recur uh, earthquake occurrence in that area. That was definitely controlled by an important crustal terrain boundary. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so now we'd like to welcome Benjamin Rito Nevis, who's going to tell us about uh, the tectonostratigraphic evolution of part of the Brasiliano belt of South America. Um, welcome, Benjamin. Let's go to South America, about 12,000 kilometers from here. Um, yeah, if, if you'd, you either have to stand there, or you can use the microphone. I don't need microphone, I would like to just press the green one. The green one? Perhaps. Oh yeah, no, the thing's not working, is it? Sorry. This is a kind of paleogeographic map of South America and Africa. With one, you can see in blue the oceans, the, the lost branch of the ocean, and the big craters. So you have to speak into the. Okay. Or you can have the microphone. Okay. Now, if I speak here. Okay. Here, this is a recent map of South America. We can see the big Amazonia crater, the big San Francisco crater, the Paraiba crater. Here you see very small blocks. My talk will be about these blocks. We have two problems. First, to understand the meaning of these blocks, because they vary from 10,000 kilometers up to 40,000 kilometers. Okay, next. This is, the, again, the South American map that you can divide in two parts. The eastern part, western part, has Laurentian affinities. And the eastern part is the Brazilian college. This is Brazilian college. Every single other Brazilian and Pan-African is in this part. Next, please. This block, this is small blocks, generally are called basement layers, terrains, massifs, medium massifs, blocks, and so on. When we start to study, we see that each one has a problem that we have to take in consideration. I try to classify here basement fissures of the foreland of the folded thrust belt. So, Sobradinho, Cavalcante, Goiânia, Porteria and Granja. I'll talk about Additional tectonic actors in the major tectonic process of plate interaction. 
Generally, we, the reconstructions of the orogenes are work with two or three plates. We can see that we have more than two or three plates. Many times we have microplates and microcontinent in the process. I will give some examples, Central Goiás, Pernambuco Lagoas, West Pernambuco Lagoas, and Caissara Campinote. And some that are dominated by the structural condition. Nice domes, trash fold, transcurrent fold, slivers, duplex, and so on. Special case of strong upper crust zomation, only zomation of the upper crust. And the final combination of two more codes mentioned here. Let's go. This, uh, in the, the Brazilian collage, we have three major fold belts. The west one, that is called Tocantins, the northeast one, that is called Borborema, and the southeast, that is called Mantiqueira. This is the central one. You can see here the, this long fold belt that comes from Roquelides in Africa up to Serra de Córdoba in Argentina. I will talk about this massif here, Massif Central of Goiás, and this massif here. The next, please. This is the ma central massif of Goiás, you can see here, about 35,000 kilometers, square kilometers. You can see here the food, the, the food belt, the food belt, the supercrustals, and this massif has everything a crater has. TTG nice greenstone belts, but it was completely reworked by the Brazilian. You see that in this side, we have the so-called Goiás bag matriarch. We have here 200 million of years of the arc magmatism. So the central massif of Goiás worked out as the upper plate for this magmatism. The, the other one, that's, oh, this is okay, 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 please, back. The other one, Conceição Natividade, here you have a lot of orthodice, uh, Siderian age, Siderian age, and here, Riacian age. Uh, we have some graphite charged, peraluminous nice, etc., etc. We do not have a good interpretation for, the, for this position. Probably, this is the basement, exposure of basement of the forland thrust of belt that is covered by the bambui here. Next. This is very common around the crato. You see here, the São Francisco Crato, we have Conceição Natividade here, we have Sobradinho Massif here, you can see Sobradinho Massif here, uh, the Peau Massif here, and here the Porteirinha Massif and the Goiânia Massif. This probably was a microcontinent. You can see the thrust fold, the thrust, the, the thrust folds push, pushing over the Crato. The same here in Sobradinho. Here is the limit between the Hellworth Brazilian area and the not Hellworth Brazilian area, the São Francisco Crato. This has about 8,000 kilometers, square kilometer, with nice and some Brazilian granites. This one, Goiás, has Archean, Paroproterozoic nice, and remnants of greenstone belts. Next. The next belt is the Borborema province that has continuity in Africa. This is very interesting because I can tell you, massive, fold belt, magmatic art, fold belt, massive, fold belt, massive, fold belt, fold belt, uh, massive, fold belt, massive, fold belt, massive. You see a mosaic-like institute that has continuity in Africa. This fold, for instance, the Lanavent Pats, goes up to the Egypt, according to Martin De Witt. I cannot talk about all of them. I will talk about this that have Archean, Toya Trauá, São José do Campeste, Pernambuco Lagoas, and AA, Alto Mochotó. Next, please. This is the Troia Massif, Troia Trauá Massif. You can see that it's bounded by fold, the Destral fold here, and the Sinastral fold here. We have New proterozoic rocks. This is completely new proterozoic, essentially big matai, <coughs> but some super crustals and some mafic ultramafic rocks, about 80,000 square kilometers. In this side, we have low grade super crustal. In this side, I have low grade super crustal. So I believe that we have an uplift of this between the two folds. Next. The São José do Campeche, for your curiosity. The first area of Northeast where we found the Paleoarchean. Here you have two Paleoarchean. 
de, de Teixeira e de Bom Jesus. Ria. This is Paleo Arqueano. This, eu sei, Grey, everything is Miso Arqueano. Everything is Miso Arqueano. And this is New Arqueano. This is Big Matites, the Ortonais. This is Ortonais with the Fibolites. It's a long area, about 20,000 20, square kilometers. Once again, we have low grade rocks here and low grade rocks here. And a transformed fold here. And this side is the continental mark. So I believe that it's formed by a lift conducted by this fold and this fold here. <laughs> Next. Next, please. Okay. This is a Automoshoto, huh? about 20,000 square kilometers. You can see here thrust fold. Important thrust fold. This, and here a transparent fold. This thrust fold, you can see the frontal area of the thrust fold. Here's the floor, floor thrust, and here's the upper part. This can be the road. You can see here the face of the fold. These are granularites of 580 million of years, and these are nice archaean and paleoprotozoic. <coughs> Next. The Pernambuco Lagoas Massif, the super terrain, about 70,000 square kilometers. We can divide in three different parts. This, this part here with Archean, 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 Antonian. This part here with a lot of the Brasiliano, and this part here with a lot of Brazilian. The uh, important thing here is the area of um, a magma arc here, showing this worked out as a kind of upper plate. The Sergi Pano Belt is here. We have subduction toward north, and these are grandurites, about 18 stocks of grandurite with VAG affinity. So, in this case, the called superterrain, we have a, 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 once again a microplate. Next. Go ahead. In South Brazil, the area that Pedro Azuar talked about, we have the first one. Here's the, the, the main area of Furi, of the Rio de Janeiro. We have here a fragment that probably comes from Angola, the Cabo Frio Nice, with age 1.8, 1.9, make matites, granites. <coughs> it was recognized on the other side of Africa. So it's a fragment of the continental marsh that stays in Brazil. Next. This is the most complicated area of Brazil, the southern part of that area that Bizet, uh, Pedro Soares talked about. You can see here a transform fold. This is a transform fold. Let's see if I go. Everything north of this is pre brazilian We have just here some better said in Brazil than that said there. Once again, you have a microplane. This, for me, is the, the major problem of the geology of Brazil. The basement is our metamorphic rocks, volcanic, sedimentary, and plutonic. And you have it. one, two, three, four, five, six Brazilian plutons of ma magmatic affinity. So you have a basement that's completely different than we have in the whole Brazil, with some of the marks. So this is different. I'm hoping that could be part of the Paraná Panema block, that is the Craton block, that's inside of the Paraná basin. The Embu terrain is about 500 kilometers long, 500 kilometers long, uh, about 30, 40 kilometers wide. Mainly schists, younger than 900 million of years, with an important event of of 700. 90 million, that it's uncommon for the whole Brazil. It's go from here to the Rio de Janeiro. Né? And the third one I want to talk about is the Atumba block, this block here, that has a behavior of a, a, a continental plate. Next. This is the Atumba complex, you can see here. You can see that the Atumba complex, Curitiba, we have uh, the interpretation of Miguel Bazé, we have that it has subductions to the Paranaparema, and here we have it, it works as a microplate. This is the rule is our class. Next. So, that's a 
there's something missing the 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 common examples models for plate tectonics because I, I have never seen the presence of these blocks. Yeah? <laughs> I know about the the Perigondwana blocks, the north of Africa. Here's a, a, a very similar example. Instead to, to use the tectonic carpentine that's very linked with the North American Cordillera, we better show that we have different types. For example, exposures of the Forland Folders Belt, actors, additional actors, microplate, microcontinents, among the big plates. Some cases with structural conditions, nice domes, trash pool, transport pool, slivers, duplex, special case of strong affirmation, that's the case of professional activity. I don't know why, maybe a nice dome, and most of the times, combination of two or more cows measurable. Thank you for your kind attention. Great, Benjamin. Thank you. Um, you, you have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Any anybody? Sin, would you like to answer a question? Do you want to talk into that? Try that. Okay. Simply needs a map. I can No, no, you can't. Oh. Well, you can. No, no, don't, don't say that. <laughs> I'm forbidden. Um, uh, Dixon, I was struck by the, your presentation and Dixon Cun um, Cunningham's presentation uh, mm -hmm. pointing out ribbon tectonics or, and, and it, as well in, in the Northern Cordillera in North America, uh, the, the role of translational fault systems in orogenesis is, uh, uh, I'm particularly struck by what you presented and wondered if you've made comparisons with active deformation um, and translational tectonic processes. We have some cases. Uh, you want a different slide? Yeah. Back, back, back. We have some example back, 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 back. Okay, here, oh, one, here, yeah. here. We have some cases that I agree with Cunningham. You see this part here? You see that I, I put the name of Massif here, Rio Piranhas. Yeah? I didn't talk about it. Because in my opinion, this fold belt here is an intercontinental fold belt. The, the Rio Piranha block <coughs> take an advantage of this fault line that is a transform line and pulled it completely the, the, the same doorbell. So we have some of this case. Probably inside of the Pernambuco Lagoas super terrain, we could have it this because we have four belts here and four belts. Probably you have a remnant of, of these belts over the, the massifs. My, my point is the following. The term massif, the term block, the term micro, microcontinent, microprate, we have to see each case because these blocks have different providence. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, what we'll do is we open. Have, we have wine now, free. Yeah, we have wine free, yes. We have 10 minutes and wine free after the 10 minutes. So um, if we've got the, any further questions about uh, any of the talks this afternoon, then. Um, Randall's got a, to a question for himself. Um, I need to make a clarification about something I said during my presentation, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I have been contacted by Richard England at the University of Leicester, who, who has been watching the proceedings online. And it turns out that I'm guilty of communicating what turns out to be hearsay, in fact, possibly malicious hearsay that was communicated to me regarding the costs of the, the, the services being provided by Size UK. So I wish to clarify that. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that everybody has laughed because I'm feeling quite serious at the moment myself. But I do want to say that Richard has reliably informed me that instrumentation from Size UK is still free at point of use to users without NERC support. And that people with Research Council support do pay, but the, but the costs are not uh, in the range of equivalent to buying new instrumentation. So I'm very sorry for giving you the wrong information about that. 
And, that that uh, will have gone out worldwide, that uh, apology, yeah. so thanks very much. For that. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm afraid I had a Boris moment. So in Cape Town, they'll wonder what we're talking about. But, uh, okay, um, there was some questions here. Bruce, did you have a... No, no, sorry, uh, someone was trying to catch my... Yeah. Yeah, this is a question for Peter Molnar or anybody here, and that is when we hear about uh, lower crustal thickening in Tibet, I've always wondered what is that geological process, and what would we expect to see in the rock record if we eroded down to those levels? For example, I live in southeastern Connecticut now, and I live on top of, well, within five minutes of my house, we have uh, isoclinal folds, um, which are with horizontal uh, axial surfaces, and um, everything seems to be very flattened, and this is an area that's been very extended um, post orogenic collapse in the southern Appalachians, and I wondered, am I living within the deep expression of what was, what was once a Tibetan plateau uplift? And what would we expect to see in the lower crust in terms of the structural geology? Um, is it on? It's on. Yeah, I'll stand in front. Um, I, I'd like to answer that first with a bit of history. Um, 40 years ago, 41 years ago, we had a conference about Tibet where Jim McClelland from Colgate University came down and gave a talk about these enormous folds in the Adirondacks, 25 kilometer wavelength folds, or recumbent folds, 25 kilometers wrapped around. And I think it was Dan actually said, what would you see, because these are, these have been exhumed from 30 kilometers depth, what would you see at the surface when that was going on? And without a moment's breath, Kevin Burke yelled out, yaks. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that Kevin was right, <laughs> but that was why Jim was at this conference, was to talk about those folds. So that's, that's a possibility. Um, my impression is if you go into deeply exhumed rock, it's very foliated, uh, whether that's due to vertical compression and flattening, which it could well be. Um, a second story, we wrote a paper, some of us wrote a paper a few years ago arguing that you have anisotropy in the lower crust, middle lower crust of Tibet due to vertical flattening and we used mica as the mineral of choice because it's very anisotropic and a friend came to me and said, Peter, you, did, you titled the paper altogether wrong. You should have entitled it Evidence for Mica in the in the lower crust. I don't know. I think I'm probably better. Uh, <laughs> I mean what 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 Peter I mean first of all I should say I used to very much agree with what Peter and Greg Hausman had to say about this and I was co author of a paper with them uh, which has 700 citations now, and I think it is completely wrong. <laughs> the, the thing that we, I think we made two mistakes. The, 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 the first uh, point, which I think is really important, is that Peter's story today assumed that actually there were no very large horizontal motions within the crust. Right. And if you say, no, that's not true, and that this is a gravity current which is flowing out over India from the north, then that is absolutely not true. You cannot, uh, the, the, the horizontal variations, uh, the, the, the vertical variations of the horizontal velocity are, are, in my view, enormous. And that's what we're looking at with the folding, right? And I think if you were actually to look at depth, beneath Tibet, you would see in the top three or four kilometers, which is as far as the earthquakes go, right, you'd see the motion that you see at the surface. But the crust is 80 kilometers thick, and my view is that the Indian shield, right, and the Indian crust go essentially three or four hundred ki uh, kilometers north of the Himalayan front. And that what's actually driving the whole of what we see is a gravity current flowing out over India. Now, what we can see now, which Peter didn't say anything at all about, 
right, is the fact that the lithosphere beneath Tibet is the thickest on the planet. There is absolutely not a trace of any delamination. The top of that lithosphere has indeed a, high, a, a low velocity. It's being heated, in my view, from the radioactivity in the crust on top, and the heat is being conducted downwards. The composition of the volcanics in Tibet, as he said, they're very high in potassium. What he didn't say is that they're very high in all the really incompatible trace elements. And if you try and model this, what you have to have is a Hartzbergite source. This source, like essentially the same source as you need for the Kimberlites in South Africa. And this source is very much lighter than the mantle below. It will not detach, and that is presumably why the lithosphere is so much thicker than it is in the surrounding regions. So this is really from stuff which, I mean, I look back and say, I mean, could I have avoided being so stupid when I wrote that <laughs> paper? <laughs> it isn't obvious that you can, right? I think that what one has to do, if you're going to work at the, at, at the edge, which is what all scientists like to do, is every now and again you make a howler, right? And there's no way out of that. You're going to, sooner or later, you're going to do something which you really regret. And I really regret that, right? And I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to agree with what Peter has to say about this. I think it's completely wrong, and I think that you actually have to deal with what has happened in the last 10 years. Would you like to say anything? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should no, no. Let, let me start by saying I have more experience with howlers than he does. I'm <laughs> wrong more often. Uh, but to, and, and I won't argue with the Hartzbergite because uh, he's. I'd know a foraminifera from a Hartzkebergite if it came in the room, but beyond that, I'm out of it. But uh, regarding the, sub, the uh, subcontinental mantle lithosphere of Tibet, the strain rate field that you get from GPS looks, it aligns very well with the shear wave splitting one gets from Tibet. Maybe it's an accident, but the shear wave splitting measurements show a wide range of orientations. It's quite large. Uh, this suggests that the mantle has deformed. This is how you get shear wave splitting. It's consistent, albeit with the present day strain rate field, it takes finite strain to create, uh, to align the, the olivine to make this. Again, assuming it's a lattice preferred orientation, maybe Dan doubts that too. But in terms of a test, is the mantle doing what the upper crust is doing? Boy, that's a pretty good test that fits very well. And one last thing, we do have earthquakes in southern Tibet, albeit only in southern Tibet. He and I argue about whether they're in the mantle or the lower crust. I'm, I'm, we're both inflexible, I think. Um, or at least I'm inflexible on this one. It doesn't matter. This is way, way down. These are 90 kilometers down. So in southern Tibet, you have normal faulting, east-west east -west extension. It looks just the same as what you have at the surface. So maybe I should learn more about Harksburite, but um, I find other evidence that's consistent with what I think. Indeed, evidence that blobs have dropped off, yeah, we grope. Oh, let's, let's define terms. Dan says the lithosphere is thick. What he means is the, there are high speeds going down to 250 or 300 kilometers. Whether you call that lithosphere or not, it doesn't matter. I would like to have that be little blobs dripping off in, in lots of different places and ponding down there at, let's say, 300 kilometers depth. I can contrive an explanation where that will work. That doesn't make it right, of course. And there's one other thing I was going to say uh, where I disagree with you again. <laughs> uh, maybe that's enough. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think that probably is. Um, so, thank you to all the speakers this afternoon, and thanks for that great discussion at the end. Eh? Thank you, your contributions, and uh, yeah, round of applause.